All right, hello, hello. This is CG5, and welcome to my this short of shortish series of videos that I'm calling "Making Better Moves," uh, where I will talk a bit more in depth about various card hunter topics, and hopefully, from the ramblings, we can learn something. Uh, the idea is that if you're like 1500 and below, you'll hopefully definitely learn at least one thing. If you're in like the 15 to 1650 range, you'll learn like half a thing. And if you're consistently 1650 and up, then y'all can start teaching me something instead. Anyway, so in the first video, let's talk about being efficient and making efficient moves. Because being efficient, that, that's important, right? Like, because right in theory, we all sort of have the same amount of cards to work with. And if you can make better use of your cards than your opponent, you're, you're going places. Um, so let's talk about it. And unfortunately, so th this is a tactics-based game, right? Um, all the cards we play, all, all our little decisions of where to um, put our people and when to play our cards and who to attack and whatnot. So there's going to be a lot of examples just because the game games can play out rather differently depending on what happens, right? Um, that's yeah, that's part of the game. So th these aren't exactly hard and fast rules, but these are just meant to be examples to sort of help you know guide your thinking, help you notice better what people mean when they say stuff like, you know, do as much as you can in as few moves as possible, which is a very vague statement, but true. And again, hopefully this will give you a better idea of stuff. And honestly, Probably a lot of those games, examples I'm going to show, especially at the start, is probably stuff you've all seen in your games. So let's talk about like the stupidly obvious version of efficient, right? Um, let's say our human priest, priest, hello. So let's say for for some reason uh, it, it looked like this, right? And we want to move our priest somewhere. Well. Let's say we want to move our priest onto here. Well, we can't, because, you know, zone of control from this dwarf warrior. Can't really move very far with our priest. Um, uh, let's say we want to attack the dwarf warrior, right? Um, and we know the dwarf warrior has a card in hand. Maybe it's the start of a round or something. Are you just going to walk, like, right here? And then the dwarf warrior walks back, and, and you're stuck. You're you, this priest is doing nothing. That's a terrible place to be, right? That's inefficient. That's bad. That's not what we want. Now, okay, that was a stupidly obvious example, but now that we have that blatant example of what not to do, let's look at some better things to do. Okay, so let's talk about what it means to be efficient. That's important. That's important. Um, so in my mind, being efficient, there's like several qualities you're looking for. One, um, There are moves that let you remain flexible, like especially early, like especially if it's like an opening situation like this, you're choosing where to first go. You want something that leaves you very open and flexible and be, being able to respond to where your opponent go, goes and whatever surprises they might have, like for, from a team sprint or you know whatever else, right? There's a surprise, you can still have a decent response to it. And sim on that, on that same vein, I think a, a, a good move, that's sort of telling of an efficient one, is that it doesn't obviously give away what you're trying to do. And to lead into that, um, I think an efficient, efficient move should be able to do, it should have multiple meanings, or it sets up possible different possible plays. So like the most, the most obvious one, right, is like, Right, warrior moves in between two squishy targets that the warrior wants to chop up, and right, very obvious. Okay, you have two targets you want to hit. Your opponent can only move one away. You get like a guaranteed attack onto the other one. Efficient, right? You you use one move and you don't like sort of like strand yourself. You're you're able to get an attack off, assuming that's what your warrior wants to do. Um, in this case, you're on the victory squares, which is you know, a fantastic place to be, generally speaking. You know, stuff like that, right? So that's like the super classic obvious example that we've all seen. Another big example, right, is you have a unit 
with defender's block. So right, say our priest friend here has a defender's block. Woo! Say priest has defender's block. And I don't know, maybe we sprint or something with a store for here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And what do we do with this priest now? Well, shit, what if the priest you know, runs all the way here? Oh, three spaces has defender's block coverage. And no, this did actually, right? What I'm trying to highlight is defender's block, but also more importantly, the priest moved forward into a spot they probably want to move to anyways, right? Sort of further up. It's in a good place to um, help support the friend on the following turn. The priest didn't really have better options either. Um, from that corner position, the more common spot would probably be around here, especially if the, the dwarf warrior hadn't gone up here as well to maintain line of sight to at least your wizard to protect them in some way. Um, but given the situation, moving up here, nice and efficient. It's something that this person wanted to do while also providing a block at the same time. And it's actually fun in this example, right? Um, right? One thing you often see people do is, is like check for blocks. And part of that is to make your attacks, your bigger attacks, actually count and connect, right? If you throw a weak attack you don't want into a block, then you're making sure that you're really, your hard hitting attacks actually connect, do a lot of damage, put you in a better position, etc. So right, one fun thing you can do in this case that you often see is, okay, this dwarf sprinted up here, this dwarf will get an attack or pass, and that's a situation we will talk about in probably another video. <clears throat> Let's say they attack, right? Um, this dwarf uses a weak attack to check to see if there's blocks. Oh, what's this? No blocks? Then the priest runs up, and if the dwarf goes for a bigger attack, surprise, defender's block, haha, I win, etc, etc. So that's probably something we've all seen a lot as well. <clears throat> Especially if you were around when Defender's block was first buffed into its current incarnation. Other fun examples? Perhaps this priest was over here, and perhaps kind of lowish. And let's say that this priest has both an attack, like a spear, spear of darkness, for example, or fiery stab, as well as a greater heal, or maybe a, a nimbus, right? So moving here, Oh shit, well once again it's a, it's a sort of a natural spot we want to go to, um, but now once again you're doing multiple things with that one move. You're threatening both an attack onto this one, the priest there, and also healing your friend here. And depending, right, if the priest is low, they might be scared. They might be like, oh, huh, interesting. And if they're worried about an attack, it's possible they, you know, waddle away somewhere. And then you get a heal and now your warrior's happy, etc, etc. Um, <clears throat> alternatively, it might be a situation where both this dwarf warrior and that human, uh, shit, this dwarf warrior, the pumpkin dwarf warrior and the human priest are both low. And so, in that case, right, the, the, this human priest, that player has a decision to make. Okay, do we go for a trade, right, kill kill the uh, the dwarf, but then they kill my character, or do I try to preserve mine, and then in which case they would then heal and preserve theirs, right? So a lot of decisions to make depending on the actual state of the game. Again, these are examples. Things depend a lot. That's going to be a major theme <laughs> of these videos. One, depends a lot on the situation, and two, um, hopefully along the way we, we can... Um, I think another important part of the game is figuring out what your opponent's up to and trying to have a good read into that. And I think um, as we sort of explore some of these examples, hopefully we can get a better, a better idea of what that means, what different plays could look like, what it means when people do a seemingly random pass or, you know, whatever else. And like the last, you know, example of a super common example that we've all seen and done in our regular games, I'm sure. Um, I don't know how this happened, but don't worry about it. Okay, so the enemy dwarf warrior just moved up. Enemy dwarf warrior just moved up. What do we do with our elf priest now, or elf wizard? Most likely run them away somewhere. And where do we run them to? Maybe. 
just around like here or so. And what that does, obviously, obviously, keep them safe. But you run, you move in a way that you maintain line of sight to the victory squares or whatever other areas you might want to have some influence in, right? Um, I know the first the first stupid example I gave of like you want to move as far as you can with the with my human priests, the dwarf warrior over there, right? It's kind of saying, oh, you want to move as far as you can. Not quite. You don't always want to move as far as you can. You want to move into a spot that gives you a lot of options and flexibility. And so a spot like where that elf wizard is is really nice, has really nice sight lines here, should the um, dwarf warrior try and go around this way, um, still is line of sight the victory squares, you know, stuff like that. And there is a better example, than better spot to go than here, because charge exists, brutal charge slash mighty charge, especially if you suspect um, another werewolf, if they've been howling for example, don't want to stand there, give them free thing. That's another very basic type of you know being efficient, right? Obviously, from a charge, ideally you move and get damage in, right? The more you get out of your cards, the more efficient they are. Easy examples, but yeah, you know these. Hopefully, these examples we've talked about all things that you've done before, that you've seen, that you recognize, and again, hopefully you are doing these kind of moves in your own play. Um, another fun type of move might be um, right, the huge line of difficult terrain here. And let's say we want the priest to go further in, get around here, right? Maybe they have a Nimbus or whatever, and just, regardless, they just want to get further in here. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously just running, moving right now as the priest doesn't do much. It's that, <laughs> we're back to that first example I gave, where if the priest waddles here, the dwarf, happily waddles back, or attacks, or just something, and the priest is stranded and maybe can't do as much as they'd want. Now maybe they're okay with this if they had a stabs, they might be okay with that. But if we assume they want to go further in, this is not great, right? So what if instead of moving that priest first, what if instead we had our dwarf Let's we'll say the dwarf was there first, and then you know, dwarf walks up. Right, and the walk up here is with the express purpose of getting the the express purpose of getting the enemy warrior to move. If the enemy warrior does move out of the way, say the dwarf doesn't want to play. Now suddenly there's that little gap is open, and our priest can finally move in. Probably over this way to maintain line of sight with your friends. Cool. So that's actually another interesting dynamic to note. Moving together coordinate as a team. That's probably a little bit harder, but um, that can be a bit harder at times because that's something that your opponent's going to try to disrupt as much as possible, especially if they have wizards and they have ways to move your opponents around. Um, so that actually sort of gets into like my next like general topic of being efficient. Another another way it takes form is right, both as I said, messing with your opponents as much as possible and like making it inconvenient for them, and also moving as little as possible to get your things done. And that's especially important for priests and wizards because they typically have less moves on them, right? Wards, we sort of count on our step attacks to help cover movement issues and be able to chase enemies down. Priests and wizards, while they obviously have, you know, some moves from the boots, they don't have as high density as warriors. Wizards kind of cheat with telekinesis, gusts of war, winds of war, stuff like that, but um, priests especially, typically the least mobile. And so making sure you don't move them around unnecessarily. Very, very nice. Um, we, we talked about being flexible before, and having move cards, being able to move around, naturally lets you be flexible. Let, naturally lets you be able to move to where you need to go on the map. And if you waste moves on your priest, simply to maintain line of sight, to 
with only your own team just to apply one buff and then if your teammates like move out of line of sight again for some reason um right maybe like the from the fighting that happens or whatever and your priest is stranded and useless oh no then you're not playing the game you're not using your cards you're sad forever you are not being efficient your opponent probably is etc etc So yeah, I can, yeah. So if we extrapolate and go and just think about what I just said, oh, okay, we want to move our people efficiently. And so specifically, if we talk about maintaining line of sight to each other, for wizards, it's easy to only focus on maintaining line of sight with the opponents. So if our elf was like here, here, I think that might be good. Middle to middle, they might be able to see from here, right? Oftentimes, I think people might focus a little too much on having their wizards maintain line of sight, focusing line of sight on where the enemies are, but it's just as important to maintain line of sight to where your allies are too. Um, so you can at the very least represent potentially moving away moving one of your teammates around with that. Um, right, because it, it's probably safe to assume that a wizard typically has at least one control spell somewhere, and, you know, knowing when to use it on your teammate or just on, out, on an enemy, important. Similarly, for priests, priests have the sort of opposite problem where maybe you focus only on maintaining line of sight to your allies, Specifically, where your allies are right now, because if they do get into a fight, so right, let's say we move our priest here, right? Let's say we moved around like this. Um, okay, this is a great spot right now, right? Line of sight to people. If you have defenders blocked, this is pretty good for when your friends go in. Um, but now we need to make sure our warrior say, see, our warrior wants to go in. We need to make sure our warrior moves. We need to make sure our warrior does not move there, because then you lose line of sight. But if you move to here or here, you maintain line of sight. That's important. So this is probably that's probably where um, you'd want to begin your attack. All right, staying in line of sight. And similarly, so and yeah, I guess alternatively, right? If we had moved our priest up here. We go back to the original position of stuff, like this. Hey, at the moment it looks great for the for the priests, because they can see their friends. They can see their friends, but then once the warrior actually moves up, the priest has to spend another move just to get line of sight. It might not be able to be as helpful otherwise. And right, running out of moves is potentially problematic if you're the one getting attacked, if you're if you're stuck, if you can't move, and your opponent's right there in your face. Bad times. Bad times. Now, other ways of being efficient. Remember how earlier I said, you know, when warriors, when you, when you attack into an enemy unit, you typically use a weak attack first to check if they have a block or potentially toughness against a dwarf, followed by a big attack to be efficient with your attacks. What if we went one step further and just avoided triggering those cards in the first place? This goes back to what I was talking about, about trying to get a good read on what your opponent likely has. If you can sniff out and identify that your opponent likely has a block, and you never attack into it, they never get to use their card. If they aren't using all their cards, they're not being efficient. Um, now real quick, what I just said about using all your cards, you don't always want to use all your cards when possible, obviously. Right? You don't want to use a move just because you have a move. Um, right, definitely don't like use a move and stand in place just to say that huh, I've used all my cards, I'm winning. Don't do that, please, please don't do that. God, that that example was so devastating. I, I lost, completely lost my train of thought. Don't don't do it. I, uh, <laughs> I can't. Seriously, what the hell is I gonna say? Even my notes can't save me. Wow. 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 Okay. Don't. 
yeah, if you don't, if, if your opponent's holding onto a block the whole game and you never trigger it, right, and, and like, if they, if you've, like, successfully ignored that character, they just, they've just been sort of stuck, like, trying to inch in, trying to wait to actually do something, and you, and they have a block ready for that, that, like, epic engagement, and you just never let them use it. Um, think of how many cards they've had to discard over the course of the game that could have been more impactful if it weren't a block, right? And so you have blocks, right? The one of the big reasons why parry and defender's block are so good is because they give you an extra card. Um, more resources, more cards than your opponent. You're, you that lets you do more things, hopefully more good things. And this is why being efficient is such an important topic, because if you have less than your opponent, but you can really make full use out of all your cards, you can make it seem like you're doing so much more with it. Um, there was a there's a game I played actually like a while back um, against a really good player. I'll, I'll have a link to it in the description. But um, at one point I said, it was like, at some point in the second round, I said, they haven't even moved their priest, and I've already lost. That's a good sign that they're being efficient and making really good use out of their moves, and I wasn't. And and if you watch if you watch that game, I think there's there's actually I feel like there's a lot of cool things you can notice from that game. Hopefully, um, the opponent, Scar Pony, very very good player. Again, I'll check it out. I'll have a link in the description. But yeah, if you if you don't. Um, you know, trigger your opponent's blocks when possible. Obviously, obviously, there are times you want to, right? If you think you can secure a kill and you just want to get the block out of the way to, to get information, um, you have a bunch of attacks that so you think you can make it work. Like, yeah, right. Situations depend. Different situations, different games will call for different tactics. And you know how you choose what to do will depend on what you think your opponent's up to. Again, getting a read on your opponent, that's another topic, another video. Um, in terms of making things inefficient for your opponent, um, yeah, I've sort of I've sort of we've I've sort of covered that. We but we just take the other person's perspective. Ha! Huh, put my people in a way, right? Put my Ha, <laughs> that's convenient. Put my dwarf warrior in a spot. That makes it difficult for them to move, or that restricts their movement. It makes it easier for me to sort of, you know, control where things are. It gives me a better idea of, of where to play, how to play, stuff like that. Um, similarly, if you're on, if you're using like Telekinesis or Gust of War, um, put your opponents in weird spots, try to break line of sight. From their opponents, that's something I've been emphasizing a bit more recently. Make things inconvenient for your opponent. Make them have to move awkwardly and stumble and... Right, if, if you're making it inefficient for them, they're not going to be happy about it, and... If they're not doing what they want... Hopefully that gives you the leverage and room you need to make better moves, better plays, and... Feel good about things. Somewhat... Related... So, if we want to make things, keep things awkward and inefficient for the opponent, then we want to avoid making moves that help them make shape, to use a Go proverb. Um, or don't make moves that they'd want to naturally make and or that sort of strengthen their positioning, their 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 overall position in the game while hurting your own. So one of like, there's this sad, sad, sad example that I saw one time, I think on this map. So let's say our dwarf warrior moves up to around here, and then our opponent, the elf wizard is like, ooh, tasty dwarf. I like eating dwarves. I'm gonna go here. This is a weird map for wizards and stuff. Um, but this seems like a reasonable space because, hey, look, we can see the victory squares. We are actively threatening this um, dwarf warrior in some way. 
we have oh god how do you play on this map holy crap i'm trying to think of because because like if the dwarf warrior actually gets in on the elf wizard it's really like if the dwarf warrior ever happens to land here in one move say from dash team or dangerous maneuver where the hell can the elf go right there's there's fucking nowhere right their best bet would be go here and then from step and actually for those of dwarf warrior um all three of these are actually really good places to step to depending on what you're looking to do um so this one is sort of very confrontational and looks to split this elf wizard from their friends um because if the elf wizard now runs down around here Note the dwarf warrior is already one step closer to the elf wizard, and also um, is in a better range to start fighting and poking away at their opponents too. Right? If, the, if this one had nimble strike, for example, um, now the dwarf warrior can just jump in and pin the priest or even the dwarf warrior, depending on what you're looking to do. And similarly, if the elf wizard chooses to go this way, well, shit, the one the the devil trains there makes things inconvenient. And now look, if the dwarf warrior has a nimble strike, always a safe assumption to have. Vroom! And sort of split off. You know, the, the line of sight thing with the priest is really nice. The priest having line of sight with the wizard is really nice, but it's it's just awkward. And right, it's like if the, now if we approach, say an approach like that, um, well shit, you've just helped, you've just, given your opponent, right? It's like you're, it's like, right, the example, right, the example of like a nice move to, ha to make is getting in between two of your opponent's characters, so you, you're guaranteed an attack on one. If you move into a situation like this, it's like um, the pumpkin dwarf did a free quick run into the middle and got to go again, right? This is stuff you don't want to do, and that's very much an example of um, not letting your opponent, not helping your opponents make shape. This is a weird example of just, it's it's not, you're putting yourself into a bad position by making a move like that. If we assume the dwarf has like a full hand of cards and stuff, right? My, my, my assumptions are changing as the example goes, which makes it a bit hard to follow. Um, and you see how this can depend, right? If, if, Right, this is much, th this move, moving the, the normal dwarf warrior next to the pumpkin is a much worse move if the pumpkin dwarf has a lot of cards in hand, because that means a lot of threat, a lot of potential, right? But if, there's, if the dwarf, if the pumpkin dwarf only had, say, one card in hand when you did this, it's probably a pretty safe bet then, because um, there's just less they can do. So again, things depend, right? Um... I'm gonna really quickly talk about the other following nice places, why these are also good places to step for the uh, the dwarf. And then we'll go back to the original example. My God, I really can talk about this for hours, holy hell. Okay. So say the dwarf uses a step attack. Let's talk, let's talk about this one first, because this one seems a bit more obvious, right? Okay, we're on the victory squares, great. We get, we get a stab off, great. But what happens now is when the elf moves this way, you're in a weird spot. You're in a much weirder spot. Um, so this, right, you're, you're, you're trading, you know, having presence and influ having presence on the victory squares and using that as pressure versus more direct pressure of trying to eat the tasty elf wizard. And so, yeah. So the dwarf stepping here sort of puts the most direct pressure onto the elf in that they can't freely move this way either. So like they have to move this way, but it's it's, it's a weird compromise that's actually um Yeah, the elf can't move this way, but when they move try to move this way, the dwarf is in a slightly better spot. It's a little bit easier to catch up. So this middle spot is like a, the weirdest awkwardest compromise. Um, hmm. 
I actually wonder if the middle is the worst spot, actually. Because, right, when going this way, if the elf goes this way and we do get to sort of trap the elf wizard here and split and cut him off from the team, that's really nice. That's really nice. Um, and again, like, moving on to the victory square directly lets us pass, right? We, we force the opponent to do more things and, you know, sort of like waste some of their cards and options um, before we decide how we want to proceed with our game. But okay, that, that aside, and so that's a sign of a good map when it's not clear where you should put your people. <laughs> so original sequence, dwarf moves, dwarf moves up, elf wizard moves up, and now the dwarf, this player immediately moves their dwarf again somewhere else, at a line of sight. Let's say they go here. Let's say they go to a dinky ass place like that. So they've spent two cards, if, it, or if the example is about not helping your opponents make shape, they've spent two cards, two movement cards, to bring out the opponent's elf wizard into a place they naturally want to go to anyway. And they, they, they didn't even pass after the elf wizard moved. They've got no information from the elf wizard while burning away two very important cards Right, moving cards, especially important on a dwarf. That is terrible. Don't do that. Don't do that. So if it look, you've you've and where's your dwarf now? They've done nothing. They're not even in line of sight with their human priest, so now that now the priest has to move like here or here. Which okay, they probably wanted to, but depending on stuff, maybe they wanted to go here. Right? And look, oh shit, still can't see. Still can't see. What are we doing? Life sucks. Don't do stuff like this. Another thing I wanted to cover in terms of being efficient is... Imagine the following scenario that we've probably all seen before. Um, have you ever had a moment in one of your games where your opponent made like a weird looking move and you hit them in some way and in doing so you trigger sparkling cloth armor or vengeance or swarm of bats? I had one of those. I thought so. We've we've all been there. Um, so let's talk. Let's talk about that. What does it mean when your opponent makes a weird move, and how should you best respond? Once again, it depends. Depends a lot on the game. But 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 we can still talk about general things. So let's talk about. Oh boy, there's always so much to say. So remember how earlier on in the video I said that a sign of an efficient move or you know things that good players tend to do, they'll make a move such that it isn't obvious what they're actually trying to do, right? And so a less good player will make one of those kind of awkward moves and hope and pray and count on you attacking them. And then they can feel, and they can feel very clever about it. And so, if you suspect that, right? Pass, pass, and right, especially if they, if you, yeah, if you think you have one of those things I listed, sparkling cloth armor, vengeance, or swarm of bats, which trigger on either being attacked from the front or taking damage, and you just, and you don't do any of that. That's amazing. And they're just they're just sitting there in they're just sitting there in stupid land and and they're being inefficient, right? If they actually want to use their person now, they have they need some other way to get them in there. Right? If they had Swarm Bats, now they have to manually play it, and that's just so much worse that way. If they are counting on getting in with vengeance and you don't ever attack them, then they're they're just fully stuck. They're being inefficient and I'll stop saying that because y'all get it at this point. So passing, pretty good option. Let's say we're trying, we're making the weird moves because we have a super awesome combo. We just need that one extra move to get set up. So we'll do something that looks kind of weird, count on them passing, and then doing something awesome afterwards. 
that thing you're doing had really better be freaking worth it. Because in that situation we described, right? right we first moved somewhere, maybe we moved here. Um, right, so we're down here, and then hoo hoo, tasty dwarf. Um, we move here, they pass, and then we, I don't know, put stone spikes under it. That's not good enough. We, it, it needs to be really worth it because in this type of example, if we're making a weird, not so good move and counting on them to pass so that we can do another thing, sort of get like a free cantrip, right? We are spending two cards to do one thing, and that one thing had, again, really better be worth it. Because by spending those two cards while your opponent just passed and did nothing, they have so much more information, right? They know, okay, that's that's like, that's one less thing to worry about from this person. You're using up all your options, and you don't even know if that was the best play or not. Which is why it had really better be worth it if you make that kind of setup type move. Um, so what's a good kind of setup type move? Um, the old classic quick run, all out attack, you know, obliterating chop or mighty bludgeon onto one or two people. That's, that's pretty worth it. And if you're worried about that, if you suspect that might be happening, maybe you don't pass in that situation, right? It depends, once again, it depends on what you think your opponent has. If you've noticed one where you're just sort of sitting back and waiting around, um, over the course of the round, you do stuff, they just still haven't done anything, and then, then you make a move, and then suddenly they move. Then you might want to be suspicious. Uh, but again, even then, right, like, say we wanted to go after the, the wizard, Ideally, you just move in a way that reduces their chance of doing anything, right? If you're counting on the, right, say say we move into open territory and be like, ha, this is a stupid move and you're never going to believe and you're not going to do anything. And we count on them to pass. What if they don't pass? What if they use telekinesis right now and put you like right there? And, and then you're stuck. <laughs> um, so I guess this wasn't helpful because once again it depends, right? Like, if there is something you're worried about, then you should be proactive in responding to it. But if you're not actually worried, if you don't think it's anything real, take you can afford to pass and see what it is and see what's up. Um, probably it, it's it's a it's a heuristic. It's a nice heuristic to have. It's nice to keep in mind that the more they do, right? They're just giving you information. Um, which is why I made a big deal of that earlier example when I said, oh hey, that first example when the, the dwarf moved up, the elf wizard moved, and then the dwarf ran away, and I said, you moved away without getting inf any information. That's important because you don't know, you still don't, you have no idea what this wizard has. What if the wizard didn't actually want to like use a mighty spark or whatever? What if they actually just want to put out illusory bear? You don't know that. And you moved there? Right? Okay, you dodged the mighty spark, but what if they had the illusory barrier? Now they plop it. Now they plop it there. And your dwarf is really stuck. Or they could even plop it like that and make it really weird for, for your dwarf. Um, whereas if the dwarf was still around here and we had the elf plop out the barrier like this, you know, for example, well, okay, shit, we'll just move. Like, even if you want to move, it's right, it's not nearly as bad as position to be in. There's probably so much more I could say, but I just can't think of stuff. But I feel like, sort of what I want to say, that's a good enough base to work with. Maybe not as many, like, cool, like, expert-level, in-depth examples or whatever, but... You know, there's, there's probably a lot of good things that you're already doing already. Um, it'd be fun to hear examples from y'all. Maybe there's something, if there's a play you really like doing, there's something you're proud of. Um, if you have ideas for more topics I want to go into, please let me know as well. You can drop a comment on lit YouTube or the card under forums. It's probably the best places. Um, I do have more topics in mind, so I've got a few more videos at the very least. 
specifically some kind of scenario like this, where you approach the dwarf, you're looking to fight, and you're non the victory squares. What do you do? When do you do it? Um, what happens if they pass? You know, what does that mean? What do you do? Um, when you go in like this and you have a hand full of attacks versus when you hand of mostly like blocks or other moves, what does that mean? Why would you want to do that? Et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that'll be an interesting one and I'll probably need to play some warrior and priest centric games to get a better feel for that. <laughs> to maybe have some useful things to talk about. But until then, that'll be it for me. Thanks again and I'll see you all next time.